I want to uh, introduce our host, Amanda Waters, at the top of the screen, and uh, my co-teacher, Darine, also at the top of the screen. Hi, Rebecca. <laughs> Andrew. Does it, it look like people are on Facebook, Amanda? So we give a few more minutes? Uh, I'm working on it. Yeah, okay. I'm just about to click the go live button. Yeah. Okay. Hope you're all well wherever you are. I can't tell these days because sometimes you have a fabricated background like Harry's Beach and Molly has a sunset and <laughs> some of you I recognize just as a wall and, and bookshelf or a kitchen like Susan. <laughs> it's your real background. Hi, William. Okay, I think we're live on Facebook and the recording's going, so I think we should be all good to go. Okay. So everyone gets settled. Darine is going to lead us uh, in an awesome meditation. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm so happy to see so many familiar faces. Can you hear me okay? Yeah? Okay, great. I told Steve how nervous I was and he said, oh, just wait, you see the yogis. That's it. That's what mm -hmm. it takes. It's so true. I, there are so many uh, faces that I don't know, but um, it's nice to meet you. Um, wow. Yep. All right. Great. For some of you that doesn't know me, um, I'm from Mexico and English is my second language, as you can tell already. And um, I've been uh, assisting Michelle, Steve and Jesse for the last three years. Um, it's been a pleasure and an amazing uh, learning experience. Um, and I think that's it. All right. So let's um, just start connecting with your body posture. And see if you can find that sweet balance between relaxation and also being alert in whatever posture you're choosing to be. And perhaps we start taking a few deep breaths all the way down to our belly. We can invite the conceptual mind, the thinking mind, commentary mind, 
just to, to be at the background. We know that just for the next half an hour, we'll be shifting to a non-conceptual attention. Also, we can just set an intention to do our best to, to be kind, or caring, gentle, soft, to whatever arise in our heart, mind, body in the next 30 minutes. And see if you can bring your attention softly to, to the hearing door, ear door. And just start receiving sounds, vibration, textures, just as they are appearing. There is nothing to do here, just receive. Connecting our attention to sounds as they are appearing. And of course, the, the mind will identify it sound and um, might have a, a, a visual image or or a word a name that's totally okay we appreciate the mind and we shift back again to receiving sounds See if you can just stay with the sound as it's in its beginning, middle, and end. Whether it's pleasant or unpleasant or neutral.
just as we're receiving sounds, we can shift our attention to, to the whole body feel. And in the same way, we, here we receive sensations. perhaps temperature. Movement. It's helpful to keep just the attention open. And see what's what draws your attention just naturally. And again, here concepts like knee or neck appear in the mind. It's okay. See if we can just feel directly the language of the body through sensation. Just remember that there is nothing that we are trying to get or to do. We're just watching experience, constant change of experience. We are trying to do our best to stay connected right here in present time awareness. And it's helpful. Just check your relationship to whatever is happening. Check the quality of the mind. Is the mind allowing? Is the mind resisting? And if this is this open field, the whole body gets too overwhelming. We can shift our attention back to hearing or to a small area like our hands. And again, like landing our attention within the body, within the hands. Mm. 
listening. Perhaps for you is the movement of the breath. Whatever you feel it more predominant. We keep trusting this nonverbal relationship. Bringing curiosity. What is happening? What's already here? Not looking for it, but just receiving, receiving the sensations. Just remembering that the thinking is happening, it's not a problem, it's another experience that can be seen, recognized. We can choose to go back to any anchor that is been a safe place for us. Sounds, emotions happening. You can notice there is a sense of calm, or joy, or sadness, or fear. Naming the emotion, it's beautiful. And we also drop into the body, we feel the sensation. And just check how you're relating to experience. Again. Sometimes it's, avail it's available for us just to recognize an emotion and there is no identification whatsoever and we can just say, oh, it's just fear, just sadness. In other times, It feels like the, as, as we're watching them, you might feel that the body is tightening or we're watching it and we want to make a deal 
will watch you for a little bit, but then you might change. You, hopefully you will change. That's happening. Perhaps going back to our anchor and just stabilize the mind, relax, settle. It's helpful, it's skillful. So at times it's, it's a dance between anchoring or exploring. Six sense door, exploration.
Thank you, Doreen. Your instructions were so clear and your accent so sweet that I just was floating on a cloud of pleasant experience. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> These Sunday sittings are, for me personally, very uh, reassuring that um, the power, the groundedness, the clarity, and the liberating nature of our practice um, that we come that we come together and form community sangha, uh, which is really one and one and the same with what's called the triple gem the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha, three facets of the same jewel. <clears throat> so regardless what's happening in our, in our personal lives or on the planet, regardless of whether or not there are, are Buddhas, still the Dhamma is the, the liberating truth is uh, there's nothing that happens pleasant unpleasant or neutral no phenomena that <clears throat> we can't see clearly and that it be itself a portal for liberation that everything is an opportunity for our our own and others awakening so, so many of you we know from previous uh, sittings or retreats, uh, many of you for many years, even many decades. <clears throat> and our practice is being called upon now. It, what, what we are cultivating in our hearts is, is crucial for the well-being of others, other beings, other people, all forms of life on the planet. If we find that place of stillness and stability, connection, kindness, care, equanimity in our heart, we can be sure that it has an, an affect, an immediate one in our own body, mind, experience and world, those around us, uh, and as as far as we can imagine, uh, it's within our reach are all the beings that we have, that we can't imagine or have a feeling for everywhere. So we provide that calm, we provide the, the fruits of our own insights, you know, by continuing to do our practice our home practice or our weekly gathering here, it amplifies it uh, to a degree we really, we can't measure sort of beyond designation. The Buddha often referred to language as a, as a designator. It designates other people, places, objects, uh, and there's a limit to that, that, that the meaning, the, the meaning and means of a, ter of a word of language is to identify, to name a thing or a place or a person. And then that's it. Just leave it at that simplicity. Um, our tendency is to find more than that. You know, um, and so we build upon more information or more languaging, and that often brings up more difficult or complicated feelings, emotions, thought formations. 
and then it's more challenging. So it's good to see uh, how that might work, you know, where, where we lose the sense of just the simplicity of a thing as it is, a person as we are, as they are, uh, and realign our, our sense of grounded awareness, embodied awareness, use our body, with everything, everything that happens we can experience in this fathom long body, as the Buddha said, and the extensions of the body in the senses, visual and sound vibrations, fragrance, flavor, uh, sensation, imagination, all of that has causes and conditions right seated here in, in our bodies. So for example, if there's a, a difficult event in our personal lives, you know, we can use language to a certain extent um, to understand that and to reconnect, to communicate, uh, to bring about, to reestablish some stability and care and empathy. And then at some point, maybe it is going to our heart and feeling the depth and stillness in our own hearts that goes beyond the language. That is the ultimate healer, uh, as the Buddha taught us. If we want to know his, his skill as a spiritual physician, as a healer, that's the Buddha and the Dhamma and the Sangha. <clears throat> and the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha is, is our heart. It, the jewel is our heart itself. Darine was in her instructions talked about trusting the nonverbal. That's right clear to the point about this belonging and connecting within ourselves. And as we sit together as a Sangha <clears throat> and we recognize, we use, we have wisdom to discern when we, when we leave the nonverbal and, and stray into the, the briars of, of the verbal, the potential briars where we get caught in concept, uh, where the mind proliferates. Uh, those of you who have been practicing for some time uh, may have heard us, men heard us mention often that Pali term, papancha. Uh, papancha is a Pali word, and it's about how, how we differentiate the, the non- differential that is the the habit of differentiating non di, uh, di, di, so if we have a an experience uh, and it arises as a as a felt sense emotion or sensation or thought and and then at first, there might be the tendency just to connect with it as it is, but then we might linger and um, build upon that, embellish it, the process of fabrication, which is differentiating the non the non differentiation I can't say it. <laughs> I have to hear someone say it. Someone say it. Differentiate, differentiation? Differentiation, yes. I just caught in that little mind bubble where I'm differentiating, <laughs> where I'm embellishing. I'll use a different term. That's, that's papancha. 
that is the Papancha mind. Uh, uh, and it complicates like, our, our experience. And then we go into um, an, a reaction that is a delusion of what's actually happening. So another definition of papancha is illusion. Um, the word moha is what we usually hear for delusion or illusion. Uh, the three unhealthy psychological roots that we're trying to overcome are, are lobha, our greed, um, and dosa, aversion, anger, hatred, and moha, illusion. Uh, and then this word papancha is perhaps a more sophisticated and lengthy process of understanding what it means to, to embellish, to differentiate uh, what can't be differentiated because it's just ultimately what it is, what we experience in the moment of connection, perception, awareness, that, that non-verbal awareness, mindful awareness that connects in, initially with the sensation just as it is, with the sound vibration just as it is, uh, and the thought formation or emotion just as it is. Can we leave it just like that? In Darine's um, instructions, she, she said, if when, we're, when we have stabilized and feel that stillness in the heart and in the body, then anything can come up, even a difficult emotion, she said, like fear or like sadness. So in that in, initial moment of connecting, there, there is no d differentiation. It's just what it is. And so it can be, as she said, oh, just fear. And then we, we feel the texture of that mental, emotional nature of fear. We feel the, the physical footprints of it, how it might create a tension or tightness in the heart or the neck or the belly or wherever in the body. Uh, and then st instead of proliferating into story, into a narrative, it just stays what, with what it is. Because particularly if it's a strong emotion, uh, and we might usually the habit is to relate it to something that is recent in our experience, like this morning or yesterday or last night. And we associate it with that, you know, or what's going on uh, in the planet right now, which is you know, a lot of upheaval and a lot of uncertainty. But the stronger the emotion is, we have found, the older it likely is. The stronger our fear, the stronger our sadness, our, our anxiety. Usually it's very, very old, even so old that it's, uh, it's nonverbal in our living experience. That is before we became verbal beings at 18, 19, or 20 months old. So then it's like a, a stacking or layer, layering and many things over our life can re-trigger that original deep fear or sadness or anxiety. Uh, and, we, and we'll think we relate it to what happened this morning, uh, last night, a week ago, or on the planet. Is there a relationship? Of course there is a relationship with what's going on. But the likelihood of going beyond the means of the designation, you know, going beyond the language, is quite high because our, our habit is to fill empty space. Our, our, our habit is not to be comfortable with, with, with uncertainty, uh, with the unknown, with the ineffable. We, we wanna fill it with a, a story or a belief or a hope you know, or a fear. Uh, and it's very different than just kind of leaning back in the moment and feeling the feeling as it is. I often say feeling is healing. And what that means is that mindful feeling, sensing and knowing the present moment experience 
is healing for the precise reason that we're not proliferating. We're not differentiating. We're not going beyond the, the means, the norm. The Buddha spoke a lot about how we tend to uh, complicate what is ultimately uncomplicated. To, to make it more, to make it better, uh, to, to fill experience with some sort of self-structure, which, which is always changing. We like ourselves, we don't like ourselves, uh, we uh, project onto ourselves, we project onto others. All of that is in that, that uh, under that rubric of papancha, of fabrication, of uh, complicating what's ultimately uncomplicated. Uh, I remember practicing in Burma in very early years when I was a, uh, a monk uh, with Upandita, uh, and I had I had met this monk, the Sayadaw, this revered monk known as Tang Pulu Sayadaw. Uh, and I had a, a great admiration and projection on Tang Pulu Sayadaw, uh, primarily because he spent 33 years in a cave uh, without ever lying down. He, he had made a, a resolution to, to keep his practice and his energy and his awareness strong by vowing not to lie down so that he might uh, lose the progression of his practice or become lazy or uh, fall into sloth and torpor. I really don't know what the reasons are, but it was just admirable. It was a kind of uh, uh, ascetic practice. So I went to report to Upandita one morning and I said, uh, he asked how I was, how I had been doing the last few days. I said, well, I felt really tired. He said, why are you tired? He said, well, I haven't been lying down. He said, well, why haven't you been lying down? And I told him, I told him, you know, I was inspired by a Tangpulu Sayada, who he, of course, knew. And, and so I wanted to try that, and I wanted to keep my energy up. And he said, why don't you just keep it simple? <laughs> Why are you complicated? What is ultimately so simple? <laughs> he said, now go back and lay down and, and, and rest. And I asked him, well, how long shall I rest, Saido? He said, well, rest for as long as it takes a monk's or a nun's hair to dry after they have bathed. <laughs> And I said, oh, okay. <laughs> so I went back and I bathed and I laid down. And 20 minutes later, uh, my hair was dry. <laughs> it's very short, of course. I hardly had any. I had just shaved a few days before. But funny enough, it, I was rested. It, it was just enough. He had reassured me. He had mirrored where I was at. He thought it was kind of funny. You know, I was always doing experiments like that. And he would, he would, he wouldn't reprimand me. He wouldn't tell me not to do it. He just asked me something like he did. You know, well, why don't you just keep it simple? Why complicated? The uncomplicated. You know, when he first taught in Hawaii, it was here on the Big Island, uh, down south, a ways at this uh, retreat center, and there was about eighty students. Uh, and uh, a great number of them were old, older students, I mean, old having practiced for a long time, but there were a few new students. Uh, and I was up in his uh, quarters once, and he was watching, as he liked to do, like a hawk, he was watching people doing walking meditation, you know, how carefully were they lifting, moving, placing, stopping, turning, and he would just check, he could, he could sense whether they were being mindful or not mindful. And there, there was this one yogi who had not done a Vipassana retreat before. And he had 
he was obviously a yoga practitioner. So on this particular walking session, that, that yogi was uh, walking on his hands. <laughs> and someone else in the room knew that as a yoga posture called the scorpion posture. So from then on, Sayada Upandita called him the scorpion yogi. And he never said anything to that yogi or, or anyone else. But the implication was clear. You know, why complicate the uncomplicated? <laughs> I mean, I suppose if one can do the scorpion posture throughout a Vipassana retreat, you know, in, in all cases, um, possible to get liberated. But I couldn't. <laughs> I, I never even tried the scorpion posture it looked, because his legs were point, you know, were like the tail of the scorpion. <laughs> and it looked quite authentic. Uh, how mindful it was, I can't say. I don't know. That's beyond my designated means of language. <laughs> the Buddha's uh, disciple, the, the monk who was chief in wisdom, he had a, a monk chief in wisdom and a nun chief in wisdom. Um, he, he spoke a lot about um, the, the means beyond natural limitations. So what's, what is within our natural limitations, we could call our ancestral land. Our ancestral land, we could say what we can know mindfully about experience. And what we can know mindfully about experience is anything that occurs in the body. All the sensations that occur, the textures and temperature, and movement, fluidity and cohesion, heat and cold, movement and vibration, and so forth. This we can know. We can know directly, non-verbally, immediately. No need for embellishment. And we can know feeling tone, uh, as Darina instructed today. We can know it in a moment's experience as either, as either pleasant, unpleasant, or having a neutral feeling tone, neither pleasant or unpleasant. So feeling here isn't emotion. It's simply, is that sensation in the body unpleasant or pleasant or neither? Is the emotion that we're experiencing now pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral? You know, Maybe it's a calm quality of calm, which is usually a pleasant experience of, of that particular mental mood or mental state. Uh, if it's anger, if we look at it directly and clearly, probably not going to experience it uh, as a, having a pleasant feeling tone accompanying that particular emotion in that moment. Once it's passed, as Darine said, when we really can experience fear as just fear and it falls away, in the wake of its falling away, there is often a pleasant feeling tone. In the, in the absence of that anger or the stability that might be there or the calm or the insight that might be there. Insight is always accompanied by a pleasant feeling tone. Even insight into dukkha. Dukkha is the term, the first noble truth uh, that the Buddha spoke uh, for dissatisfaction, unreliability, anxiety, stress, because of the very impermanent nature of phenomena, because things are just immediately falling away, washing away, disappearing, or just changing. The mere fact <clears throat> that one day one thing can be pleasant and be this and the next day be unpleasant and be that, that creates this dynamic of anxiety and stress. That's dukkha. <clears throat> and also, and built in that is the um, unreliability or the uncontrollability. We can't make, we can't cause that fear uh, once it's passed. We can't keep fear from arising again. It would not be the same fear, but maybe there's a pattern of that fear or that sadness. 
uh, and that so something like it re-arises later. We don't have the capacity, the control within our, whatever self structure we might create that keeps it away, that keeps it at bay. And we don't have a self structure ever that can cause um, courage and confidence and joy and happiness and peace to stay, even though we might experience it deeply and even for prolonged periods of time in our practice, in our lives. Understanding that, the very understanding of that resets that pattern of, of dukkha and the cause of that dukkha, which is uh, clinging or craving or attachment to keep the pleasant and push away the unpleasant. When we see that patterning working, for a moment it ceases. So if dukkha is the first noble truth, uh, craving and along with craving, pancha we could say, illusion, keeps that cycle going because we'll keep searching for happiness where it isn't. Or we'll keep trying to push away difficulty and pain um, because we don't understand that we don't, we don't have the power really to push that away. But once we see that it's causes and conditions and not oneself, not a self-structure that create all of our experience, pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral, that create fear, anxiety, and stress to arise, and also create uh, courage and confidence, purity of mind, and liberating insight to arise. When, when we understand that, that moment of understanding is pleasant, is joyful, and liberating. And it's called cessation, because it's the cessation of that cycle, that whole papancha cycle. Because of the papancha, and because of our habit of going after something, of filling the void, filling empty space, thus that samsaric rounds keep going on, and we're caught on that wheel. But every time we see that, uh, we weaken it. There's a moment of cessation, whether or not we recognize it. With practice, we begin to recognize it more and more, and, and that deepens our confidence and our courage and our energy and the continuity of mindfulness, which then keeps breaking that pattern until we recognize it more often, more soon. We, we see that tendency to fill empty space, to fill silence with noise, with a narrative, with a story. And, and instead of doing that, we say, oh yeah, okay, that's the, that's the pancha mind. That's how we complicate what is ultimately uncomplicated. <laughs> that the body and everything that we experience in the body arises due to causes and conditions. Emotions, uh, our thought patterns, our feelings, all of them arise due to different causes and conditions. In fact, mindfulness and loving kindness, some of the causes and conditions that influence how we experience the body and the emotions and, and mental phenomena and experience it more and more with more and more wisdom so that the papancha is greatly reduced. Complicated, the uncomplicated is greatly reduced. And then we just begin to relax more and more behind no matter what's happening how intensely pleasurable and joyful, how intensely unpleasurable and, and horrible experiences. It's all experience. It's all happening on its own. And these cycles of being pulled into the papancha aspect of it um, can be and is deeply and profoundly influenced by our practices of love and understanding by our mindfulness practice, by our metta practice, our compassion practice, and our joy practice. So I would like, to, I'd like us to, to end today's session with a 
little meditation, short meditation, using loving kindness or compassion or joy, if you can feel that mudita, empathy. We empathize wherever there's creativity, beauty, promise, happiness, or, or equanimity. That quality of heart that is so profoundly stable and can be at peace regardless of what's happening. The uncontrollable pain and pleasures, joys and sorrows that occur. But just feel the body as you're experiencing it now. Is there, is there heat or coolness, pressure, tension, relaxation, buoyancy, fluidity, vibration? Doesn't matter. <clears throat> it is just as it is, not to complicate it. Not to feel it should be anything other than what it is. And then call up one of these Brahma Viharas. One or more. Just see what is available. You can call it up this way. May metta, the loving kindness, friendliness, and connection of metta arise now. You can put your attention around your heart center or actually touch your heart center. And sometimes the very warmth, contact, and pressure of the hand reflects or mirrors the metta, friendliness, warmth, tenderness. Or the care of karuna, compassion, caring for our own or others' pain, anxiety, fear, and stress. I care. <clears throat> I care about this pain. My pain, your pain. I care about dukkha. Or if the mudita element arises where you feel you feel happy about you feel joy about another's happiness or a particular place that is special to you. That all you have to do is see it in the mind's eye. That particular place, waterfall, forest, monastery, beach, or a person or a pet whose happiness means everything to you, a child. And so, even though there might be so much difficulty happening all around, that place, that child, that person, their goodness, their very goodness and pureness causes joy to arise in the heart. all pleasant feeling tones. So the metta, friendliness toward every element of our body, mind, being, and others, connecting with others, our sangha, our community. The reassurance it provides ourselves and others. And caring wherever there's dukkha, suffering, pain. It's pleasant to care. And of course, the mudita is itself the definition of joy. Pleasant feeling tone and pleasant emotion of mudita toward that child's goodness, that special place, that special person. If it's equanimity, we call up upeka. 
which means to, to look over or to look upon as opposed to looking away from experience. We look upon all experience with this profound mental equipoise, stability, capacity for peace in the face of life's vicissitudes, the joys and sorrows that can be at times on the edge of overwhelm. And Upeka is staying just this side of overwhelm. It's connecting with everything as it is, all the true joys and all the real sorrows. But the mind stays in balance. There's an understanding that all, all beings meet their joys and sorrows according to nature causes and conditions. And at this moment with the Upeka heart, it doesn't go into the proliferation. It doesn't go into complicating what is ultimately uncomplicated. It's just things as they are. every moment of, of pure mindfulness, we are free of that tendency of differentiating, non-differentiation. -differ and the next moment, the same. So all those moments of mindfulness are doing so much more than we might imagine on the deepest level of tendency, the deep mind tendency that we don't usually see and experience. Well, I'm grateful. I'm grateful for these Sunday sittings. I'm grateful that we're all practicing together and holding each other. And in so many ways, really holding so many others holding so much that needs holding now on the planet. Thank you. We have time for maybe two or three questions if anyone has a question about practice we can keep it oriented to Dhamma of the Dhamma realm, that's, that's what we do here. That's what we occupy uh, with such profound effect and affect on ourselves and others. So please. 
And if we have a, a question for Stephen or Darine, if you go to the um, participants uh, link at the bottom of your screen and then click raise hand, um, we'll know that you have a question and then I can help unmute you so that you can ask your question. Sun, I see you raising your hand. Uh, you're muted. So I'm curious to know how to do Buddha Nu Sati. To say that again? The, how to practice the reflections of the qualities of the Buddha, Buddha Nu Sati. You mean contemplating the good qualities of the Buddha? Yes. Uh, you know how Michelle often speaks about the happy Sayadaw? Yes. Yeah, right. So he, 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 practiced, he practiced that a lot. Not, he, he, he would choose the qualities, some of the qualities of the Buddha that meant a lot to him, that were meaningful to him. Like, uh, as you re recall, probably from some of the talks uh, we've given, especially Michelle, um, like bre breathing in uh, that I'm going to die and breathing out, so are you going to die? The, the quality, that quality of the Buddha, the Buddha had on reflection on death, which is one of the four protections along with metta and impermanence uh, and so forth. Uh, so I, my suggestion is that you review for yourself qualities of the Buddha, such as his, he was free of the tendency of this differentiation. He kept things on that uh, non-papancha level. He kept it, he was, did not have the tendency to fill uh, the void, to fill empty space, to fill silence, to fill the unknown. Our, our to, with anything, our story, our narrative, our fear, our hope. He was kind of free of that. That's a huge contemplation, right? Mm. Uh, so my suggestion is to think for yourself of what you admire of things you've heard about the Buddha, his teaching, the clarity of it, mm -hmm. his skill in means, of seeing exactly what it is that you need in this moment, but what particular teaching that's effective for you. And you can be your own Buddha. You could ask yourself, would metta be helpful right now? And not answer it with mental words, not answer it with papancha. Just ask the question and see what happens. You know, which of the Brahma Viharas? Or how can I be more mindful with speech? You know, the Buddha had that clear and perfect vacha, voice, words, use of words, skill and means of his, his the sweetness of the sound of his voice and the clarity and the particular words that were meant to incite inspiration and, and practice and understanding. But you don't have to follow like the the Abhidhamma list or all the lists of the qualities, like the nine qualities of the Buddha. I don't even remember them all right now, so I'm not going to repeat them. <laughs> I'm going to leave that up to you. And then make use of what you yourself come up with rather than it's on Google or in a book or because I said, I would, I would offer more right now, but I can't remember any of the nine qualities of the Buddha to reflect on. But uh, the Happy Sayada also talked about um, self-esteem, right? And, and feeling good about himself and feeling good about others 
rather than that shame and judging mind. And so you can, you can call up worthiness. He, he used that as a reflection as well on the Buddha. Just as I am worthy, so are you worthy. Or just as the Buddha is worthy, so am I worthy. You know, something like that. The happy side, uh, he, he would creatively make it his own. I offer you that. Sarina, you have anything to add? Okay. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, you're welcome. One other thing I want to mention in regard to our practice today is something you've heard me mention a lot, the older students of, of mine and Michelle's and Darine's and Jesse's. When Upandita said to me uh, once in an interview that side by side with the that proliferating mind, the conceptual proliferation of papancha, that side by side with that, the meditative mind is developing. So that we don't get into this fixation that we have to get rid of papancha be before we can develop calm and insight. It's not true. And it's why I say every time we're mindful of the proliferating mind uh, of the differentiation of what's uh, not differentiated, um, we weaken it. We, we lessen that habit, we lessen that tendency. So it just, it all happens in a micro moment, a nano moment. We see it and for that moment we cease. And as Darine said in her instruction, then fear is just fear. Sadness is just sadness. Joy is just joy. We don't have to push it away or hold on to it side by side with the papancha mind, the meditative mind continues to develop and unfold. We comprehend the first noble truth of dukkha. We abandon the craving and the papancha uh, and we realize the cessation of that and we develop the fourth noble truth is we develop calm and insight, the Eightfold Path. Comprehend, abandon, uh, cessation or realization of cessation and development. So that process is going on side by side with the Papancha. Just always take a moment when we realize rather than reflect and condemn or, or judge the, our Papancha mind, just in the moment of recognition, we are comprehending. We're comprehending dukkha. We're abandoning craving and papancha, and we're realizing the cessation of it, the tendency, weakening. And then we are developing calm and insight, love and understanding. It's all moment after moment after moment. right now. So that's where our confidence is built. Okay, I don't have to do anything about that. I'm seeing it as it is. And it's just happening on its own. Those moments that we all have where we lean back on time. And it's like watching a movie. Yeah, sometimes it's a papancha movie with a myriad dyes and colors and formations and sounds and so forth. And other times, it's just, it's more like one of those 6,000 mile generated storms, you know, uh, off the Tasman Sea that sends these, these 
these formations, these deep forces that you can't see across the sea, that finally they come up to the shores and break on the beaches of Hawaii. And if I'm lucky, I'm down here surfing on them. <laughs> but as they're moving along, you don't, you don't notice them. That's how powerful our practice is. They, they hit on the very the ocean bottom, if you will, of the mind, of the heart. And they're cleansing all these tendencies to fill what we think is empty, to create a story about ourselves, to set yet another self-structure that we have to defend or project or judge. Any more questions today for Darine, myself, instructions, the talk, or your practice? And if you're having trouble finding the raised hand button, you're welcome to send a message. I can unmute you that way too. Kathy. Hi, I was thinking maybe everyone was trying to not fill the space. <laughs> um, and um, so this isn't really a question, um, but I was reading the biography um, of Ajahn Chah. Um, and it talks about how when he was training, it was very intense. Um, and, you know, he would like meditate all night and then sleep for a few hours during the day and then meditate all night again. And then just like on and on and like meditating through malarial fevers and intestinal distress. And, and it was intense. Like it was, there was this real intensity to the practice and it was so inspiring. Um, but also like, it felt like a lot to live up. Like, I, I don't know, I felt like I wanted to live up to that. Cause I, I, I just feel like there's such like a, like a potential, like a depth to the practice. And um, I think there's a desire to find out more, but there's also a fear at the same time of like, what if, I'm not good enough. Like I can't, I feel like those two things are kind of, yeah. Which two things? Kind of like there's a desire. The desire um, and, and the, the practice, uh, And also yeah. there's the fear of, of meeting, of encountering difficulties and mm -hmm. not being able to overcome them. Right. Yes. So what happens when you experience that desire and that fear? Um, just acknowledging, yeah. acknowledging both and acknowledging that, you know, Ajahn Chah was Ajahn Chah, right? <laughs> like there's only one Ajahn Chah. Um, yeah. And yeah. it is inspiring. And, it is. Uh, yeah. It is. And he was a spiritual warrior. Yes as was Upandita. Uh, and I visited Ajahn Chah's monastery in the 70s. Uh, and I even saw the, the well in which, you know, when he had tired Western students, he'd, he'd tell them to go sit at the edge of the well. <laughs> and that they probably would wake up. <laughs> he had that ferocity. He had that energy. You know, he practiced in that warrior mode a lot um, but actually by the time i met him in the 70s he was also quite laid back and humorous funny engaging 
kind, you know, he had that aspect too. So I, I think, you know, we, we all have to kind of look in our hearts. I, I also felt a similar inspiration to practice in those ways, especially in that that's a monastic way. I mean, you don't have to be a monastic to practice that way, but it's encouraged in, in some of those um, Asian monasteries where the, the, the abbot or abbotess himself or herself, that was the way that they did it. So like even within the Mahasi system, so, some were known as more like warrior monks or nuns and some were like the metta monk or nun and, and their whole practice was very different. They, you, you, when they passed you, you feel their wake of metta and it'd be so soothing and so loving and, and so embracing and engaging. You know, you, you just find yourself following along in that wake. <laughs> At other times you'd see or hear about uh, you know, a warrior monk or nun style of practice. And that's like, that's what made me vow not to lie down, like mm -hmm. Tangpu Lusayra mm -hmm. to 33 years in a cave that way. That's how, that was their form for liberation. But it's not, it's not the form for liberation. You don't have to practice. You can practice, you can practice with ultimate urgency but in a soft style, you know, or you can practice with ultimate urgency, but a real charging warrior, stay awake style and push the edge. How much of, do you really need of sleep? I used to keep a little notebook where I'd account for every moment of 24 hours mm -hmm. until I could see how many moments I was missing until my sleep went down to four hours, three hours, two hours, 90 minutes, 60 minutes, and sometimes no sleep. Because I was so intent on being aware every mind moment. And as I followed that, you know, but, but then for, it would work for a while, you know, and I'd find some, I'd find some traction in that style of practice, but ultimately, I had to readjust or reset every time, every, so if I practice like that for a few months at a time, maybe I'd, I'd crash, I might finally crash and Upandita would change the style. He'd have me do uh, a lot of the Brahma Viharas and Brahma Vihara practice, which does not require that push, that intense warrior style, in fact, just the opposite. So ultimately, the, the two were combined in my own personal practice by Upandita. The Brahma Vihara practice and the Vipassana practice were interwoven. And that was right for me, especially as I got older <laughs> and achier. Thank you. Thank you so yeah. much. You're welcome. Stephen, did you want to take one more question? It looks like uh, there's one, one more raised hand. Okay. Yeah, I'm happy to take one more. Where's that? Sun? Yeah. Yeah, you just need to unmute yourself. You have to unmute. Okay. Yeah. So, how did you combine the two? Uh, Brahma, Brahma Vihara, and yeah. um, to put it very simply, I would start. Uh, I would make a mind, mental resolve. So it might go something like you know, 20 minutes of Brahma Vihara practice, and then. Um, or maybe 10 minutes of one Brahma Vihara, 10 minutes of another, and let's say maybe I do three Brahma Viharas in, in the first 45 minutes, and, and then switch to come out of the Brahma Vihara concentration practice and focus on Vipassana. Watch the dissolution of the Brahma Vihara concentration states. I would just make that that resolve and then that's it 
no more effort to control or no looking at the clock or watch or anything. It was just to make that resolve and do it. And later on, I'd say a, a certain a certain pattern unfolded where um, w when I needed to restore or reset or, uh, or refresh, I would I would lean back into a Brahma Vihara. You know, Mahasi would talk about it as when you feel a lot of dukkha, you know, to the edge of overwhelm, then call up a Brahma Vihara. And then when, when you no longer feel that overwhelm, then resort again to wisdom practice. Because ultimately it's the wisdom practice that is liberating. The Brahma Viharas can be stepping stones along the way. They can be one's path to Vipassana insight and liberation. Or, or, and in the way I just described, it was more side by side. Some Brahma Vihara and, and some Vipassana. Some Brahma Vihara and some Vipassana. And I would usually, so I wouldn't be careless and um, a just knee jerk reaction to where, whenever there was difficulty, I would still set, I would still preset it with a resolve. You know, 20 minutes of Brahma Vihara, 20 minutes of Vipassana, 20 minutes of Brahma Vihara, something like that. So I, I learned for myself what worked. Upandita didn't tell me exactly how to do it. I would re report to him and he might make some correction or steer me back in a way or give me a further instruction about how to use the uh, Brahma Vihara concentration practice in service of the Vipassana liberation practice. Yeah, that, that clear? Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Very helpful. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, all you beautiful beings. Thank you for your practice. Thank you for supporting each other. Thank you for doing all that you're doing for the planet today, for yourselves, your family, all beings everywhere. Blessings. I see Japan, I see Australia, I see California and Oregon and British Columbia. East Coast. Mm -hmm. Hi, Bruce. Hi, Susan. Bye bye, Thank Kay. Bye bye. <laughs> Harry. <laughs> Kathy.